<laughs> we are so glad you are here this morning. If you're visiting with us, we are glad you are here this morning. It was already mentioned, but we're glad for everyone tuning in online as well. Welcome to our fall focus on the family. Uh, during these fall months that we are now in, we're spending some time together as a church family to focus on the family, both in the sense of a spiritual family that we are here as the church, and then also your family at home, your own individual family. Uh, our desire is that we want to grow together as a family, so I, I've called this series Leaves of Faith, Growing Together as a Family. Now, if you look at the, uh, well, they don't have the slide up right this second, but I, we, what we did last week, we're going to be five weeks uh, in this series together. Five weeks that we're going to spend looking at the idea of what does it mean as a church family, and then what does it mean for you and your family to grow together spiritually. So we started last week with the first message looking at the idea of sharing or spreading the seeds of faith. <coughs> and we looked at a very popular story that's found in the um, several of the Gospels, in all three of the Synoptic Gospels, a parable that Jesus told about one who would scatter seeds. They call it often the seed of the sower. But we discussed a little bit last week that it might more accurately be described uh, the parable of the soils. Because the soil represented the heart that would receive the seeds of faith, the word of God, and how different hearts receive the word differently, and how we need to prepare and have the kind of heart that would hear and receive and believe and study and act on and apply God's word in our life. Today we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about uh, nurturing the roots that we have in this faith. Next week, on week three, we're going to talk about the family uh, tree of life. I want to explore the idea of what does it mean and what does it look like to hand our legacy down, to pass on to the next generation this faith in which we so strongly believe. Uh, in week four, we're going to talk about pruning for growth and look at how sometimes trials and, and difficulties can actually strengthen the family bond. I think that's true in a church, and I think that can be true in your own family as well, and kind of how that, you know, the, the earthly example uh, of the importance of pruning, you know, never have to prune these ones, fortunately. These are the ones I prefer to have in my yard, but the, the importance of pruning something and how that pruning can actually increase and, and actually cause growth to happen. And then we're going to wrap it up week five. That will be... Uh, uh, what will week five be? I don't have the date down. Uh, that, that'll be the second week in November. So in, in week five, we're going to talk about a harvest of faith, and we'll reflect on the spiritual growth and the blessings that come from having a life that's rooted in faith, a life that uh, produces this abundant harvest of faith. And we'll be doing a deep dive into Galatians chapter five, where Paul talks about the, the fruit of the spirit, the importance of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and, and self-control. At least that's the way I memorized it from the 1984 uh, NIV translation of the Bible. And then, believe it or not, the week after that would be November 19th, which will be the Sunday before Thanksgiving. Do you believe that? So th then I got a very special message I planned to preach that morning on gratitude. We're going to talk a little bit about that. Then it's the five weeks, and Christmas is here, and we got to, so only ten Sundays from now. I'm going to preach to you, hopefully, Lord willing, ten more sermons, and it will be 2024. How crazy is that, right? So it's just the time is going by like that, but I'm so thankful for this, this time that we have together, this season that, that God has, has brought us to. And I'm looking forward to uh, the rest of this series as well. If you have your bulletin, uh, hopefully they'll get the screen fixed. If not, everything is on the bulletin. This has uh, some blanks. Most of the scriptures we're going to look at. And I want you to look at that very first scripture. You may want to open your Bible to the passage that uh, Jim read for us. Oh, the slides aren't up there. Okay. Sorry about that, guys. Um, the first message, then just use your Bible. We'll do this like back in the days before we had the overhead, right? I, should, I could have brought a sheet that I could have written on. <laughs> Open your Bible to Psalm chapter 1. Psalm chapter 1. Psalm chapter 1, King David would have likely pinned this psalm like he did most of the psalms. And it starts off with saying, blessed is the one, 
And the positive, it, he, he, he reflects, he shows the difference between the negative and the positive in this. But he said, blessed is the one whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaves do not wither. Whatever they do, look at this promise, whatever they do prospers. See, King David penned these words as a reminder of the blessing that came from delighting in the law of the Lord. What we would say would be our Bible today, delighting in the God's word, meditating on his teaching, the Bible says, day and night. Now, if you're like me, when you think of meditation, a lot of us, the first place our mind goes is to like some guy in India sitting on a carpet, his legs are up over top of his head, and there's incense and candles burning, and he's holding his hands like that, and he's going, mmm. Right. I mean, did any of you else think of that when I say meditation, right? That's what comes to mind. But the Eastern concept of meditation and the biblical concept of meditation, very, very different. Because in the Eastern concept, that what they say with meditating like that, you are emptying your mind. Now, for some of you, that's easier than others, right? But there might be a time and a place where you just kind of want to clear your mind, empty your thoughts. But biblical meditation is literally the opposite of that. Biblical meditation is I am filling my mind. I want to fill my mind with the truth of God's word. It seeks to fulfill our mind with the teachings that comes from God's word. Biblical meditation is not empty minded, but it's filling our mind. Meditating on God's word means I am actively thinking I'm, I'm reflecting. Uh, I, I'm, I'm trying to think of ways that I can apply the Bible, God's word, scripture to my life. And that leads, according to this psalm here, that leads to spiritual growth. It leads to spiritual insight. It leads to a deeper connection with God. <clears throat> psalm 1 tells us that when we do this, we're like this tree that's planted by the, a stream of water. So that those roots in the ground are able to be nourished keep the tree strong, able to grow and be what God is calling it to be. And I love how this psalm applies this to our own spiritual walk. And when we think about we're planting these seeds of faith, and then we want these roots to grow and to develop, what does it look like? So it begins with Psalm 1 saying the importance of reading in God's word, delighting in God's word, meditating on God's word, and then we become like this tree that has this healthy source of nutrients constantly coming to it. And I love, I, I love that the, grant, the, the, the verse, and it's on your outline, and sorry it's not on the screen, uh, whatever they do will prosper. When you are grounded in God's word, the promise of God is what you do will prosper. And here's the thing. People read something like that and they'll be like, oh, well, you know, that means maybe, uh, you know, if I, if, if I spend more time at church or I spend more, well, then my business will prosper. Well, then, you know, and Bob mentioned this morning, maybe I'll actually win that Powerball, you know, because I'm, I'm going to very, but, but here the psalmist David is saying, that when you are spending time in God's word and you are meditating day and night on the word of God, you start to say, Lord, how can I apply, how can I take the, the truths of your word in my life and in, in the life of my family? And, and how can I really apply that to be the spiritual tree, to have the roots that you want me to have? And God says, when that is your mindset, you will prosper. That's the text. That's the context. It's not a, you know, okay, God, he's my heavenly vending machine. I went to church this Sunday. You know, I put money in the tray. I listened to the sermon, so prosper me this week. You know? But it's, it's this idea of being, being rooted in God, in his word, in our walk with him. And if our desire is to grow, to mature, to produce spiritual fruit, works of righteousness, God says you will prosper. Just like a tree requires nourishment from the soil and water to thrive, as families, 
We need firmly rooted. We need to be firmly planted in the teachings of God's words to bear these fruits of love, this, these fruits of, of faith and, and righteousness. So I think this imagery from Psalm 1, depicting this idea of this flourishing tree, just beautifully symbolizes the potential growth and, and, and the abundance that can be attainable when we as a family prioritize nurturing, uh, steadfast, enduring uh, connection together and, and time spent in, in God's word. So what I want to do for you this morning, um, on your outline, I'll give you three things, or four things rather, four blanks to fill in. All the scriptures are going to be right there in front of you on the outline as well. And let me show you some ways that we can, that we can nurture faithful roots. Number one, fill in the first blank, write down these two words. We need to cultivate spiritual growth. Cultivate spiritual growth. Cultivate spiritual growth. Cultivating soil is something that requires deliberate and continuous effort in order to promote and to foster successful growth from whatever it is you're trying to plant in that soil. Frank and I have discussions often. Frank's got a couple acres down the road there, and he's got tons of, of all kinds of things planted all over his property. But he works hard with the kind of soil he has versus the kind of soil that we have when we're, when we're closer to the river, closer to the lake down here. Our soil tends to do a little bit better with stuff than his soil does, so he has to cultivate it. He's got to spend time and put time into it. And when it comes to our spiritual growth, it's something that you've got to put time in. You're not just going to sit back and naturally grow in the spirit just because, hey, I'm just, that's what I do. I'm just going to grow. Right? And growth is literally something that God commands us to do. It is God's desire for you to grow. We had three babies for 2023 that were born, and we're hoping to do a, a dedication sometime at the end of this month, beginning of next month. I'm doing my best, but just fortunately, we only have three families, and I can't get their schedules to get them all on one Sunday for some reason. I can't imagine churches that have like, you know, 35. How, how do they do it? I don't know. But anyway, um, uh, we, we're, we're going to dedicate the babies. Aaron has uh, Josh, no, not Josh. Josh is Katie's. That's her brother in law. Aaron has Ben. <laughs> In, in, in here right there. And right now, Ben's cute, you know, just a cute little thing, especially when he's sleeping, he's cute. But you know, two, three years from now, if he still looked like that, it wouldn't be very cute, right? I mean, it still might sort of be cute, but there'd be something wrong because he's supposed to grow. And the same is true for us spiritually. We are called, we are designed, God wants us to grow spiritually, purposefully cultivating spiritual growth. Purposefully engaging together as a family, both here at the church and at home, in spiritual practices like prayer, like reading God's word, hearing God's word, studying God's word, meditating on God's word, spending time in worship. Just like a farmer has to tend to the soil to ensure a fruitful harvest, we must continually tend to our spiritual lives, hopefully cultivating an environment that's con conducive to growing spiritually. So a couple of scriptures I put on your outline. Look at 2 Peter 3, verse 18. But grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Grow. Almost an imperative here. Grow. You, who you are in Christ 20 years ago should not be who you are in Christ today. That each day that we spend time, that we are meditating day and night on God's word, we should be maturing in our understanding of God's grace and growing in our knowledge of who and what Jesus is to us. Colossians 2, verses 6 and 7 on your outline. So then, just as you received Christ as Lord, continue to uh, your lives in him, rooted, look at that, you might circle that, rooted and built up in him, Strengthened in faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. Here Paul mentions that to the church, he's reminding us, the church in Colossae, but to us, the church today, that as a church family, we need to be rooted in and built up by Jesus. And man, if our roots are in Christ, that's going to produce spiritual growth. That is, a, that is a soil that is cultivated by the power of God's Holy Spirit in our lives. So if we're going to nurture these faithful roots in our family, 
We need to cultivate spiritual growth. Number two, fill in the next blank. Develop strong roots. Develop strong roots. Root systems are an interesting thing. I mean, you really cannot control where roots grow and, and what they do. And, and you can see obvious signs of that when you drive down the street and you'll see a big, beautiful tree. But then the sidewalk in front of the tree is doing what? It's coming up out of the ground. It's been broken, right? You have roots that get into uh, sewage systems, that, especially those of you that have septic tanks know the, the heartache and the headache that those can cause at times. But roots are essential for a tree or any kind of plant. And they do two things. And you don't have to be an agricultural you know, degree in order to understand what roots do because they feed the tree first and foremost. But what else do they do? And living in a part of the country where we see a lot of wind, we know why this is important. Not only do they feed the tree, but they do what? Anchor it. Yeah, they anchor it. They ground it. They give us stability. Christine and I, when we first moved into our home there on Turner Road, we had half a dozen of these beautiful white birch trees. Now, they look great. They're a pretty tree. The, the, the roots were getting the nutrients they need because the tree was, was you know, had uh, the leaves every year. The color of that white bark was beautiful. But as soon as we got some of those stronger delta winds that we get, you know what happened? They fell over. They would just bring the ground up with it. And it got to the point, eventually I had to cut all of them down. I, I had to, as in Bill came over and, and cut them down for me. But, but <laughs> I had to cut them all down, right? Why? It, it, they didn't have strong roots. And I think the same can be true. This was the story from last week. One of, the, one of the soils was a shallow soil, grew for a little bit, but as soon as any trial came, as soon as any hardship came, it, it fizzled out. So we understand the importance of strong roots. And to develop strong roots in a spiritual sense means that we have this firm foundation. We have this belief and this faith that we deep, deeply anchor our values and our identity in. I was so glad that the praise team and those who helped to choose our songs sang that old hymn that we've been singing since Christine and I were youth group. That, that Jesus, you're my firm foundation. Right? I, 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 what, what's the verse say? I wrote it down. I, I know I can stand secure. Jesus, you're my firm foundation. I put my hope in your holy word. Developing strong roots. Psalm 92, verses 12 and 13 on your outline. The righteous will flourish like a palm tree. They will grow like a cedar of Lebanon. Planted in the house of the Lord, they will flourish in the courts of our Lord. And when we, when we are planted in the house of God, when we are planted in the church, when we, when, when we develop and, and we establish a household that is built on the truths of God's word, the promise of scripture is you will grow. You will flourish. Ephesians 3, Paul says it this way. I pray that you, and look at our wording on here again, being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. So as a family, developing strong spiritual roots can improve uh, uh, and hopefully foster and, and cultivate the, the love, the compassion, the forgiveness that we need in the home to be, uh, to grow together as a family the way God is calling us to grow. So, so that leads to the third one then. So we cultivate spiritual growth, we develop strong roots, and we need to nurture a healthy environment. Nurture a healthy environment. For plants and trees, the environment is very important. There are plants that can grow here that in a rainforest would not do well. There are plants and trees that grow in a rainforest that if they were planted in a desert would not survive. There are things that can somehow grow in a desert, but then put them into a different, uh, nurse, uh, a, a different environment and they won't grow, they won't flourish, they'll die out. 
I, I have been blessed to, to, to travel all over the world. I mean, I, I have been in the, the, the deserts of the Middle East. I, when Christine and I have spent time in, in the high altitude mountains of South Korea. I've been in the rainforest jungles of, of Vietnam. We, we've got to visit tropical islands like Jeju Island in Hawaii. And there are just some beautiful things that you see that are conducive to their environment. That there's something about the environment that they in that make it grow. Now, it is possible to take something out of a natural environment and it can flourish if you do what? Provide the environment that it needs in order to flourish. I'll pick on Frank again just for a second. Frank actually has, is it a hibiscus? The white <coughs> plant, the Hawaiian plant in your front yard, is that right? Is it a hibiscus flower? Yeah, Frank, Frank has this beautiful hibiscus uh, plant and flower. You, you don't, what is it? Eight inches. Yeah, that's right, they're, they're huge. As the, you'll see those in, in Lodi, typically. You know why? Because they grow in Hawaii. But Frank, for whatever weird reason, he enjoys spending eight hours every other day out there making that thing grow, it does. But he, he, he makes the environment what it needs in order to grow. Church, the same is true when it comes to our family and if we're going to develop spiritual roots, if we're going to plant and grow those seeds of faith, we need a spiritual, healthy environment that is conducive to growth. Does that make sense? I mean, there is such a, to me, there is such an obvious spiritual application from this that at the church and in your home, we must cultivate a space where family can love each other, where we can encourage each other, where we are actively supporting and participating and, and uplifting and building each other, that we're striving to foster this atmosphere where hopefully communication will be wholesome here and at your home. It'll be edifying, it'll be characterized by kindness and, and understanding. A healthy environment is crucial for spiritual growth and nurturing spiritual needs. <coughs> So I love that Ephesians 4, Paul reminds the church this. Do not let unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only <coughs> what is helpful for building others up according to their needs. Why? That it may benefit those who listen. You know, when you hear or you read a text like this, unwholesome talk, the first thing we tend to think of are curse words, dirty words, four-letter, you know, F words, or any other four-letter word, I, words that will get mama soap in your mouth. And yeah, I think as believers, there probably are some adjectives that the world use that we could choose to leave out in, in our everyday speech. That's probably a good idea. But I want you to notice here that unwholesome talk, it, according to this text, is anything that the purpose behind it is not to build up the one who hears it, right? Even correcting of our children, which we need to do, can be wholesome, right? it, Because why? I'm wanting to build them up. I'm wanting to correct. I want my speech to be something that is wholesome. It, it, it builds each other up. And that's something I think should be true in the church, obviously. It should be true at your home. It should be true at your work. It should be true at your school. It, it should be true on your social media, right? That I, am, I am developing because our words are powerful. Let me tell you something, church. One of the greatest lies that we have taught our children sometimes, you may or may not be guilty of this. My grandmother was guilty of this. I may or may not have been guilty of this with my children. You know, you know what one of the greatest lies we teach our children? Sticks and stones may break my bones, but what? Words will never hurt. That is a lie. That is absolute. I, I've got all kind of broken stuff that have healed and is a little bit better than it used to be. But I can still think of things that somebody said to me 25, 35, 40 years ago, maybe even on the playground, that hurt me, right? Words are powerful. And if I am doing my best in the church, in my home, to provide an environment that is conducive for spiritual growth, I should be cautious about the junk that comes out of my mouth. I, I did have it on the big screen. I apologize. I didn't get it loaded today. But Proverbs 15.4 says, The soothing tongue is a tree of life, but a perverse tongue crushes the spirit. It's also important to understand the essential uh, uh, nature of, of forgiveness in the family, that we're commanded to mirror the kind of forgiveness that God gives us. So Ephesians, or I'm sorry, Colossians 3 on your outline, bear with each other. 
Forgive one another if you have any grievances against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. See, that fosters an environment of grace and reconciliation, which allows for spiritual roots to grow deep and strong. I, I read recently uh, a book that Barna put out. The book was called uh, You Lost Me. And in the book, they did a study about children that leave the church after they leave their home. And, and it was a, it was some stat, sad statistics in that book. In, in, in that book, now this study is a little bit dated, uh, but then one in ten, that's ten percent, of children when they leave when they leave home lose their faith in Christianity altogether. Four in ten, forty percent, leave the church but still call themselves Christians, but they're just they're not involved in church in any way. I meet people like that all the time. I, I won't. No, I won't even say it. Never mind. I, I was going to make a comment about how there are people that I see out in town who still call me their preacher, their pastor, and this church, their family, and I haven't seen them here for like four or five years. But they might hear that online and be offended. On my left, you'd be here for the first Sunday in five years. And <laughs> step on your toe. But anyway, uh, so I won't say that. But but there are some, right? Who just they they say, uh, uh, oh no, I'm a Christian. But they're just but they're not involved in. Anything Christian. That was 40%. Uh, two out of 10 in this study, in this book, it says that they disconnect from church and they express frustration about the church culture and often even disconnect from society. And then only three out of 10, 30%, stay involved in church. Now, another, we're going to talk about this a little more and more in depth next week. That's, this is the whole topic of next week's message. But another study from Lifeway. He did, the, the, this author did a study of people who had left the church after they left their home, and he was trying to figure out why. Here were the top five reasons he found. Number one was as simple as because they had moved to college. That was it. They, just, they, they, got, they went to school. They got busy in school. They, they, didn't, they didn't have friends or family around them there that, that prioritized spiritual growth in any way. They just became unplugged. Number two, it said because church members seemed judgmental or hypocritical. Three, he said I didn't feel connected to people in my church. Four, because they disagreed with the church's stance on politics or social issues. And then five, it was because my work responsibilities prevented me from attending. And then most recently, one more, most recently USA Today did a study and they claimed that nearly 75% of Christian young people fall away from the faith after they leave uh, and leave the church after high school. And, and here's the point. We're going to talk about this more next week with the idea of what it means to pass our faith down to the next generation. But we as the church, you as Christian parents, your home should be a place that is conducive to, that is an environment that allows spiritual growth. An environment that can foster forgiveness when forgiveness needs to be offered. An environment that even when fostering forgiveness still understands the importance of discipline and correction, right? A, a place where hopefully we can feel open to discuss uh, our hurts and our fears. Open to discuss our doubts. And at times that we see things happening, the craziness that's going on in our world right now, people step back and say, say, where is God? We need to be a place where hopefully we are cultivating this spiritual growth, where we are developing these spiritual roots. And the environment that we have in the church and that you have in your family as a home is one that is conducive to spiritual growth. Because if we don't, if we don't have a place, if, we do, if you don't cultivate a healthy spiritual environment, we're going to lose the next generation. We really are. You know, who, what I think it was Ronald Reagan said, we're just one generation away from losing freedom. And how much truth is that to the church and, and those who may lose their salvation and, and their relationship with God? We'll talk more on that specific topic next week. But cultivate spiritual growth for, for nurturing roots, developing these strong roots, nurturing a healthy environment where they can grow. And then number four, the last one, then we grow together. As a family, if I want to nurture strong, faithful, spiritual roots, then we got to do it together as a family. 
We discussed this some last week, but we need community. We were made for community. We were created for community. We need a faith community here as a church family. We need to make a commitment to, to one, one another to grow in our Christian walk, to grow in our knowledge of Jesus, to grow in our grace, to help one another to be grounded in faith, both in the church and in your home. Growing together spiritually involves fostering a sense of, of unity, a sense of um, humility, compassion, uh, love for one another. We did a whole series several years ago that we'll revive at some point again. Uh, there are over 54 different one another commands in the New Testament. And it's really hard to one another each other by yourself, right? There's this idea that as a family, we're coming together to encourage each other. We decide and we agree to the necessity of being committed to our times of worship, our times of prayer, our times of study, our times of fun and, and fellowship uh, that we're going to have. There's going to be a meeting uh, today right after church that Laura and some of the others are heading up with talking about some new exciting things they want to do with our kids. And, and, and just, I mean, and those things are essential. They're important. And really... When we're, when we're really committed to these things as a church and in your own family, it, not only is it, does it nurture and feed us and to grow spiritually, but when those winds, when those storms, when those hardships and challenging times come, it, it creates this supportive environment where spiritual development and hopefully even emotional well-being can be fostered. Ephesians 4 on your outline, be completely humble and gentle, be patient Bearing with one another in love. Make every effort. You might underline that part. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. I want you to notice those really important key verbs, or I guess they're not all verbs, adverbs or adjectives or adenoids. Notice the key words, the key words in this verse. Gentleness. Humility, patience, love. Man, this is how as a family, both in the church and at home, we can make every effort to keep the bond of the unity of the spirit of peace. 1 Peter 3, 8, last scripture on your outline. Finally, all of you, be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. Imagine a church family, imagine your family, even at home, where everyone is sincerely striving to be like-minded, to be sympathetic, to be loving, to be compassionate, to have and to offer humility, advocating for this, this spiritual environment, this, this atmosphere characterized by empathy and kindness and, and mutual respect. Man, we start planting those seeds of faith and the roots grow and that's how you're going to establish these roots. That's how you're going to be like that tree that Psalm 1 describes, planted by the, the river of life, of God's word. And if we're going to grow together as a family in our faith, if we're going to plant seeds of faith uh, into the hearts of the next generation, if we are going to nurture and grow strong spiritual roots, then we have to prayerfully and very deliberately choose to be involved in engaging family activities, to, to be involved in, in the church and with our families at home, to foster unity and, and, and to share in this, this common walk that we're together on this, this Christian path, this, this walk of faith that God has put before us. Sharing meals, family outings, collectively participating in spiritual practices like we did this morning with, with prayer, with the reading of the word, with taking communion together, stressing the importance of worshiping with a church family of God, encouraging open discussion, respecting each other's perspectives and experiences. This is hard. I didn't, I didn't do this as well as I would like to have when I had kids in the home. And, and, but, but I want to tell you, for those of you who do have kids at home, do your best let me share this, then I'll wrap up and be done. I'm sorry. Do your best to try to see their perspective sometimes, right? Because we do hopefully know better, but there are some things that it's okay for them to learn on their own, for them to go through things that are a big deal to them that you understand it's not a big deal, right? 
I mean, the, 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 there are phases in life where you thought having a zit on the morning before you were going to ask that guy out at school, school the next day was just the biggest, worst thing that's ever happened in your life. Right. Can't believe I got a zit. I mean, and, and if, it's a, if, if it's a big deal to them, to do your best to, to sympathize, right? To, to really have a place. And, and again, I'm sorry, but we'll talk about this more next week because I'm, I'm, I'm studying ahead. Because I'm just, I think next week's lesson is very important and what it means to pass down the faith to the next generation. I can't believe how many people that I have talked to, especially in the Army, we have these, this, these young people who were in the church. They're now in the military. Church doesn't become as important. They go through something rough. So they figure, I'm going to talk to the chaplain because I remember there's something important about a spiritual leader. And how many times they've shared with me that their home just wasn't a place where they could express fear. Where they could express their doubts. Where, where they could, because they were so concerned about the dis and, and we have to be very cautious about that. So that's why I think the Bible, both in the family as a church and in your family as well, time and time again, says be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, show compassion, show humility. So encourage those discussions and uh, doing our best to, to just respect and, and to love each other in the walk where we are and helping them hopefully to grow as you are helping us to grow. Deliberately practicing acts of kindness, expressing appreciation for one another, uh, demonstrating patience, understanding during conflicts can all contribute to nurturing an environment that promotes spiritual growth and unity here uh, as a church family and, and within your family as well. Again, I, I really want you to come back next week. I'll make sure I have a, the, the overhead working. I want to share with you some important studies and what I think are some, some biblical strategies. As we, we're looking, we're, we're planting these seeds, we're trying to nurture those roots, and then what does that mean to make sure that the next generation will do that for the next generation, which will do that for the next generation. Very similar to our, our good mission, that we love God, we love one another, we love others, and we want to make disciples. And we want to make disciples who are going to love God, love one another, love others, and then they will make disciples. Right? And, and that's what we need, not only to, to a lost world, but in our own homes, so that we don't lose the people under our own roofs. And that's why I think it's so important to have a fall focus on the family like we've been doing here. So come back for the next few weeks. It's going to be good. Let me pray for you.